At the beginning of the fourth century, Christianity was still a small religion in the Roman Empire, about one in 10 of the population, mainly in the towns. This was going to be an extraordinary century for the Christians. It would see their fortunes transformed, but it began badly. In 302, the new emperor, Diocletian, went to consult the oracle at Didyma. Apollo spoke in a voice that no human could make and declared that the presence of the just men on earth was preventing him from speaking the truth. And so the oracles from the tripod were false. And for this reason, he let his hair droop as a sign of grief and mourned the evils which the loss of true oracles would bring to mankind. And the oracle told Diocletian that the safety of his reign and of his empire depended on the elimination of a just race. And this was interpreted subsequently to mean the Christians. Diocletian responded by ordering the great persecution. As before, Christians faced torture and death, but this time the state wasn't just going after individuals, it was trying to smash the structure of the organized church. It attacks bishops to undermine the church as an institution. It seizes books, recognizing that Christianity is based on a set of scriptures. It's that seizing of bishops rather than laymen. It's that burning of books that makes Diocletian's persecution frightening. But before the persecution could do too much damage, something extraordinary happened, which would set off a chain of events crucial to Christianity. The Emperor Diocletian abdicated. His idea was that this would allow a smooth transition of power. He couldn't have been more wrong. His abdication was followed by a bloody series of civil wars as the other emperors in the Tetrarchy competed for Diocletian's senior position. The Tetrarchy was made up of the rulers of the empire's four regions. The son of one of them would be the most important figure in the history of Christianity since Paul, Constantine. Constantine's father, a general, was based in York. After his death, Constantine was proclaimed Augustus, senior emperor of the West, by his army. It wasn't enough. He wanted the whole empire. In 311, he marched south with his army. He fought his way through Gaul, smashing all opposition. In 312, he swept down the Italian peninsula. The final showdown with the rival Emperor Maxentius happened here at the Milvian Bridge, which still stands just outside Rome. Constantine was worried about the odds. He had only a little more than 25,000 men with him whereas his enemy had 100,000 men. And he knew that his enemy was a devout pagan. Constantine felt that he needed more help than human hands could give him. So he prayed to the highest deity, asking, whoever you are, Deus Sumus, give me help in my time of need. The answer came, he later told us, in the form of a vision. At about midday, when the sun was beginning to decline, he saw with his own eyes a cross of light in the heavens above the sun and the inscription, Conquer by this. At this sight, he was struck with amazement and his whole army with him. Eusebius. The scene was depicted many centuries later in these paintings in Rome when Constantine's vision had passed into Christian legend. According to Constantine, the vision was followed by a dream. Christ appeared to him, the God of the Christians, and said, use my signs, the Caeleste Signum Dei, the heavenly sign of God, and you cannot be defeated. with his new Christian emblems, Constantine engaged Maxentius's superior army and won.
Following Constantine's victory at the Milvian Bridge, like many Roman emperors before him, he entered Rome in triumph as the Augustus, as the victor. But he refused to perform the central symbolic act of a Roman triumph, the sacrifice to Jupiter at the temple on the Capitoline Hill. Constantine's refusal to perform this central rite was an indicator that he believed, in some sense, that his victory was due to the Christian God and that it would be inappropriate to sacrifice to Jupiter, who had been supporting Maxentius and had lost in the battle. Constantine would publicly attribute his victory to the God of the Christians. But was this a real conversion or a political ploy? Had he seen that instead of trying to smash the church, he could use its organisation to bolster his power? Nobody knows with Constantine how much of his, his change of heart was political, how much of it was personal. There must have been a personal element. And he clearly regarded himself as a man inspired by God. He certainly saw himself as having been given by God a colossal responsibility for the world that he governed and for the church. The advantages of aligning a single emperor in a unified empire with a single god in the heavens are, in a sense, self-evident. It allowed for the first time in the empire's history for an ideology of rule to be coordinate with a religious system. One god in heaven, one emperor at the head of a unified empire. The arch celebrating Constantine's victory still dominates the centre of Rome. But it contains no directly Christian imagery. Constantine was too canny to upset the pagan establishment straight away. Constantine's very successful in that. The ambiguous relationship with paganism and the classical past allows him to develop a religious system which doesn't alienate the ruling classes of the Eastern Mediterranean. It may not be good Christianity, but it's good politics. Under Constantine, certain pagan images and festivals began to find their way into Christianity. The sun god Helios was known by the rays around his head. These began to appear in images of Christ, developing into the familiar halo. Pagan Nikes were transformed into Christian angels. One of the most sacred days in the pagan calendar, the 25th of December, was nominated as Christ's official birth date. The old gods may still exist, but they were to be seen subordinate to the new Christian faith. And that was to be visually stamped on the city of Rome, where one had once walked through the Forum surrounded by pagan temples. Now this would be a city whose topography was dominated by Christian architecture, by basilicas, by cathedrals. These were the first great public buildings of the Christians. Constantine was proclaiming the faith in stone, marble and gold. In some, the internal decoration has changed entirely over the centuries. In others, Constantine's original vision remains intact. Constantine changed the face of Rome. Now his dreams were of a new city of his own. He looked east. He became fascinated with the possibilities, religious and strategic, of the tiny colony of Byzantium. Today's Istanbul. You could take this insignificant little Greek colony, triple it in size, close what few temples were there, and build Christian cathedrals in the heart of the city and make it a Nova Roma, a new Christian Rome. Building began in 324. Two years later, Constantine turned his back on Rome and never saw it again. It took 
took six years and colossal expenditure, but the new Rome was built and named after its founder, Constantinopolis, the city of Constantine. Today, this column, once topped with his statue, is almost all that remains of Constantine's glorious city, his monument to Christianity. Constantine wasn't alone in his great enterprise. He had a partner, his mother, Helena, who promoted Christianity with a will. In the Holy Land, she established the churches which would play a crucial role in Christianity's story. This is the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem, the site, it was believed, of Christ's crucifixion. Yards away, this chapel marks the place where Helena was believed to have discovered the actual cross on which Christ died, the true cross. In giving Jerusalem its first churches, destinations for countless pilgrims in the centuries to come, Helena was putting Christianity in touch with its past. This was a time of confidence and well-being among Christians. But along with the freedom to practice their religion came the freedom to disagree about its essential truths. Many issues which had been pushed under the carpet began to surface. Constantine finds his desk littered with petitions and counter-petitions from bishops all around the Mediterranean who want him to sort things out. So that divisions which have rumbled away in the background are now foregrounded because it seems as if for the first time there is a single and a sympathetic authority who can actually resolve some of the problems. One critical issue was whether Christ was as divine as God. The theologian Arius said not. He sets out a theology in which God alone possesses supreme power and glory and eternity, and nobody can know the mystery of what God's being is. The Son has as much of it as anybody can have, but not anything like the same degree as the Father. Others disagreed, and the issue threatened to produce anarchy not what Constantine wanted. Constantine has invested a great deal of, of hope in the Christian church. He wants it to be a, a kind of binding factor in the empire. He wants the church to work for the good, the unity of the empire, and here is the church tearing itself apart. So what do you do? Well, he thinks the thing to do is to get all the leaders of the church, or as many as possible, together, so that there is a single authoritative view with which he agrees. Bishops were summoned from all over the empire, some missing eyes or limbs as a result of Diocletian's persecution 20-odd years earlier. In 325, about 300 bishops came here to Nicaea, now Iznik in modern Turkey. Constantine presided over the debate and effectively forced it to a conclusion. Finally, the majority came came down in favour of the creed that was finally accepted, which contains a number of phrases very carefully crafted in order absolutely to exclude the beliefs of Arius. The resulting text declared that Jesus was as divine as God. It was designed to refute one fourth century bishop. It became the central creed of Christianity, the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before all worlds, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one substance with the Father, through whom all things are made, Constantine died in 337. He had transformed the status of Christianity in the empire. Christianity might have remained a minority force unless Constantine had converted. So he turned around the position of Christianity in the empire. We might say he brought them out of the catacombs or out of hiding and made them a mainstream force in Roman life. Constantine's achievement is, of course, remarkable. In his 30 years reign, he establishes Christianity as a viable religion in the Roman world. But we mustn't overrate his success. 
It's a fragile triumph at the death of Constantine. It's important to remember that Constantine's successor is a heretic, an Arian, and important to remember that his successor, Julian, in the middle of the fourth century, is a pagan, an apostate. It's not until we get three generations away from Constantine's adoption of Christianity to the reign of Theodosius I at the end of the fourth century that we can start really talking about a Christian century, about the triumph of Christianity. Under Theodosius, there was a hardening of attitude towards the pagans. Now, for the first time, Christianity became a persecutor, attacking pagans and their places of worship. These people run to attack the temples with sticks and stones and bars of iron, and in some cases with bare hands and feet. Then utter desolation follows. Statues are stripped down and altars overthrown, and the priests must either keep quiet or die. After demolishing one temple, they scurry to a second and to a third, and trophy is piled on trophy in contravention of the law. Towards the end of the century, the empire was largely Christian, but there was another victory to be won. It derived from a confrontation between Ambrose, the Bishop of Milan, and Theodosius, the emperor. The conflict between Ambrose and Theodosius crops up over a number of issues, but most dramatically with the massacre in Thessalonica. A charioteer, popular with the local crowds, had been arrested after a brawl. Wanting him for a race, the locals had broken into the prison to free him. There are riots, imperial officials are killed. The emperor decides very, very hastily to inflict very draconian punishments on the city, and several thousand people are rounded up and butchered in Thessalonica. It's in the light of that that Ambrose refuses to receive the emperor to communion until he has made public acknowledgement and done public penitence for the sin of murder. The emperor bent the knee to the bishop and did his year's penance. It was a pivotal moment in the history of Christianity. Now the religion of the humble and the dispossessed had become the religion that could direct the state.